I'm Ralph McInerney, and this is a course in uh, the history of philosophy offered by the International uh, Catholic University. First, a word about uh, the International Catholic University. Our call letters are ICU, uh, which does not mean intensive care unit. Uh, the idea of this university uh, sprang to mind uh, a few years ago uh, in the light of complaints, uh, many of them justified, uh, that had been made about uh, Catholic higher education, Catholic education in generally. The complaint being that uh, although people might take the time and the trouble uh, to seek out uh, what the uh, Catholic uh, culture and patrimony uh, was, very often they were given something else, something very watered down, sometimes something quite distorted. Uh, and it occurred to us that it might be wise to make available uh, to a wide audience by various electronic means, uh, the main elements of that patrimony. This is, this is the way the uh, idea first came to mind, uh, that it should be a university and more than just sort of metaphorical uh, employment of the term uh, was something that came along as, as step one, uh, step two that is. And uh, what we uh, decided to do was to work out programs of study uh, in both philosophy and in theology, master's programs, uh, in effect. Uh, and the course that we're embarking on uh, today uh, is uh, a course in the sequence that leads to a master's degree uh, in philosophy. The history of philosophy uh, is, uh, in very large part, the history of the history of philosophy. Uh, it is a very curious thing to try to mark the beginning uh, of that which we call philosophy. Uh, even if we track it back over recent centuries, we find many philosophers denying that other purported philosophers are doing philosophy. Philosophy seems to be largely a matter of uh, inventing itself or assuring oneself that what had gone on up to one's arrival on the scene uh, is defective in some massively important way and consequently a new beginning uh, is proposed. Now, of course, if we took that very seriously, if, uh, as people said uh, at the turn of this um, uh, century, uh, that there was um, a new beginning in philosophy, that the arrival of the sciences had completely redefined what philosophy is, uh, if uh, after the war, uh, Second World War, we took seriously the view uh, that philosophy had taken a linguistic turn, which pretty well made everything prior to it uh, obsolete, uh, there wouldn't be much need for the history of philosophy, or at least it could begin in 1945, let's say. Uh, we're not going to assume that. We're going to assume that the history of philosophy uh, covers a great many uh, years. As a matter of fact, two and a half millennia. Uh, the first philosophers uh, that uh, uh, enter into our records uh, by hearsay, of course, at first, uh, date from the uh, 6th century BC. Uh, how do we know about them? By and large, if they wrote, their writings have not come down to us. By and large, we are relying on accounts that are given of them, narrative accounts, uh, citations, uh, sometimes very long swatches, which purport to be from the writings uh, of these people. But they will be found, for example, uh, in a philosopher we will be considering in the next lecture, uh, Plato. Plato often talks about those who had preceded him uh, in philosophy and speaks uh, of them sometimes with high praise and sometimes uh, critically. Uh, Plato uh, lived into the 4th century BC, dies in the middle of the, of the 4th century. Uh, so his, um, his uh, witness uh, to his predecessors is separated from them uh, in time uh, and is very much separated from, uh, from us in time. For about a thousand years, there are people who uh, give us accounts of figures uh, at the very beginning of philosophy. Uh, it goes up into the 6th century of our era uh, with Simplicius, uh, a Neoplatonic uh, commentator on Aristotle, who in the course of explaining uh, writings of Aristotle where uh, a uh, earlier philosopher is mentioned, Simplicius will go to the trouble of retailing to us uh, the uh, texts or writings uh, of that particular uh, uh, author, that 
particular philosopher to whom Aristotle is referring, uh, he is one of our, uh, one of our um, most reliable sources. But Plato, uh, first of all, you know, just in terms of doing philosophy, uh, refers to those who had done similar things before him. And as I say, he refers to them uh, either with praise or, or with uh, blame. Uh, Aristotle, perhaps more systematically than Plato, uh, will try to give us an account of what has happened up to this point. Uh, in a particular discipline. Uh, sometimes, as we will see, we'll be talking about him in the third lecture, uh, Aristotle will say, there really wasn't anything like this prior to my efforts. Uh, he will say this about his logical writings, which are very extensive, uh, and say, well, there just, there just really weren't uh, uh, efforts to lay out argumentation, uh, forms of argumentation prior uh, to the works of Aristotle, we call collectively the organon or instrument of philosophizing, the logical work. More often than not, he is going to retail for us, recount uh, to us, uh, what uh, his predecessors had said uh, about the subject matter uh, at, uh, at hand. So uh, we, could enumerate, uh, we could enumerate the various sources. Uh, let me just, as a general proposition, refer you to uh, Kirk and Raven's uh, Pre-Socratic Philosopher, which is a standard uh, collection of texts uh, of the figures, such as we have them, uh, of these figures uh, prior to uh, Plato, let's put it that way. And you'll see when you look at it that by and large these passages are drawn uh, from later figures. St. Clement of Alexandria, for example, is a favorite uh, source uh, for our knowledge uh, of the, of the pre-Socratic. I mentioned that, uh, first of all, to give you a sense of the, of the uh, uh, duration uh, of philosophy that we are confronting here. Uh, it, uh, we have figures from the 6th century BC, uh, and here we are at the end of the, of the second millennium, and we're trying to reconstruct uh, what it is that uh, happened when philosophy had its beginning. Now, in order to identify the beginning of philosophy, we unfortunately have to have some working notion of what uh, philosophy is. And it is one of the more interesting, it seems to me, one of the more interesting uh, discussions in the sources, in Plato and in Aristotle, when they give us an account of what their predecessors uh, had uh, said, uh, what they think they and their predecessors are doing when they talk about uh, philosophy. Uh, it was fashionable when I was uh, a young student uh, to recount the progress in Greek philosophy uh, as one from uh, uh, an interest in the religious, in the divine, uh, and, uh, and the remote and transcendent, uh, as the starting point and then a progression from that to uh, a increasing interest in the things of this world. So that we would have, uh, as Auguste Comte would give us, a kind of movement from the metaphysical or theological uh, to the natural, to the, to the scientific. Uh, this is, to say the least, a fanciful uh, reconstruction of the development of philosophy, particularly if it's meant to uh, cover the earliest centuries of philosophy. But uh, a typical book in this, uh, in this line is uh, Cornforth, uh, F.M. Cornforth's uh, work from religion to philosophy. Uh, and he is suggesting that uh, they kind of got over their interest in things that uh, were not material and spatial and, uh, and the like. There is, however, something uh, to that title that's uh, worth uh, retaining. And that is this, that Aristotle will often refer to Hesiod uh, and uh, to uh, Homer. Uh, and uh, he will refer to certain theological poets, as he calls them, who are predecessors, uh, antecedents in some sense of uh, philosophy. Uh, and the question that then arises is, well, how do you distinguish? How do you distinguish uh, between what uh, the so-called theological poets uh, are doing uh, and what philosophers uh, them, uh, themselves uh, are, are up to? One of the ways in which we will see this uh, question is uh, answered is by linking uh, the religious and the poet uh, to the philosopher, 
in terms of what generates uh, the kind of discourse that uh, all of these, uh, uh, each of these three might put forward. And the genesis, uh, both Plato and Aristotle tell us, is wonder. Looking around, looking at oneself, looking at the world, raising questions about what the point of our temporal existence is, uh, and trying to give an account of that. Well, as we know, if you, if you think of, the, uh, of Homer, uh, and, you, and you think of the Iliad and the story of the battle for the city of Troy uh, to, uh, to regain uh, the purloined Helen, uh, what you have going on are heroes in the temporal realm where the battles are going on, and then in the heavens on Olympus, you have the gods and the goddesses who, somewhat arbitrarily as it might sometimes seem to us, uh, decide to champion this side or that side or this figure or that figure. So there is a two-layer uh, kind of account of what was going on in the Trojan uh, War. Uh, and it's very difficult uh, to know just what kind of causality uh, the particular human heroes are exercising uh, if they are to be regarded as instruments uh, of some more or less capricious uh, deity. That would be one uh, way in which we might say that in wondering about such a massive event as the Trojan War, uh, Homer would uh, give us an account which seeks to explain what is there before our eyes by appeal to something beyond as the real uh, explainer of these, uh, of these events. So to Hesiod, the poet, in, uh, in a work of his called Theogony, uh, which suggests the birth of the gods, tried to introduce order into the plurality of gods and the po into the polytheism uh, of, uh, of Greek religion by relating them to one another as uh, in generations, so that you would have the initial gods and then their progeny and their progeny and their progeny. And this introduced a kind of rationality, uh, it is sometimes thought, into this otherwise bewildering uh, array of divinities who were thought to be uh, causes, in some sense, of what's going on in, in the world around us. So that note, the note of wonder, uh, the poet, uh, uh, like the philosopher, as we will be saying, the poet is triggered off, his activity is triggered off by wondering, what's going on? How can I understand this? Uh, and his account is uh, of the kind that I've suggested uh, in the case of, uh, of Homer. dealing with the history of philosophy and uh, the first question we might ask is as opposed to what? I mean what is philosophy being contrasted with? Uh, so we've, we've noticed that uh, our knowledge of uh, those people who are called philosophers from the very beginning uh, is dependent upon uh, people who come a good deal later than they and who give us accounts of or sometimes long quotations uh, from their works. And they're assuring us these are philosophers. They're doing what we, these later people, Plato and Aristotle, for example, will say I'm doing. And I recognize in these predecessors uh, the same kind of activity in which uh, I am uh, presently engaged. What is it that contrasts uh, philosophers from the beginning? Uh, I mean, what to what to with what can we contrast philosophers from the beginning? What are non-philosophers like? And uh, I'm suggesting to you that if we take uh, the uh, common suggestion of Plato and Aristotle, that wonder is the beginning of uh, things for both the philosopher and the poet, we are on our way uh, to being able to give at least an initial uh, understanding of uh, what philosophy uh, is. For it is owing to their wonder, Aristotle writes, that men both now and at first began to philosophize. They wondered originally at the obvious difficulties, then advanced little by little and stated difficulties about the greater matters, for example, about the phenomena of the moon and those of the sun and of the stars and about the genesis of the universe. And a man who is puzzled and wonders thinks himself ignorant, whence even the lover of myth 
is, in a sense, a lover of wisdom, for the myth is composed of wonders. So wonder is used here as a term for that mental state in which we are confronting a phenomenon and we don't understand what's going on. Imagine uh, two and a half millennia ago uh, someone watching a, an eclipse, a lunar or a solar eclipse. His reaction is going to be very much like our own in these very sophisticated times. Uh, just a short while ago, there was a total uh, solar eclipse that was visible in many parts of the world, and it, uh, it caused a sensation. People came from great distances uh, to be in a position to see this complete eclipsing uh, of the sun. And that fills one with awe and wonder. And we, of course, have some sense uh, of what's going on uh, when uh, an eclipse takes place, but that doesn't take away awe and wonder in another sense that we will want to be returning to. But the first sense of wonder is what's happening? What's going on? And a certain kind of fright uh, accompanies uh, the sense of uh, not knowing what's happening, of being ignorant. So what Aristotle is suggesting here, and he's again uh, echoing Plato, is that wondering at what's going on around us is certainly not confined to poets and philosophers and what he calls poetic theologian, but these three tend to give accounts that are meant to address that wonder and to remove in some degree, at any rate, uh, the ignorance that, uh, that it betoken, so that the search for a state that would replace wonder is a search for an explanation. It's a search for causes. So the way in which uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, early philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, can give us a sense of how it begins is by sharing uh, the mark of the philosopher that he wonders and wants to give an explanation with the poet. And then what we require is some way of distinguishing uh, between the mythical or the poetic explanation uh, and the emerging philosophical uh, explanation. And it's here that we find the genesis of such interpretations as that of F. M. Cornforth that I mentioned uh, a little while ago, from religion to philosophy. It's as if from a mythical explanation uh, we are go which, in which invokes the transcendent or the uh, divine, we are going to get straight on appropriate explanations of what is going on uh, in an eclipse. Cornforth uh, felt wrongly uh, that that removes from the philosophical scene uh, interest in the transcendent and in the divine. Uh, it merely, uh, it merely um, locates it differently, perhaps, than uh, it had been uh, before. Um, the common note, then, we might say, is ignorance, uh, and this betokens a kind of question. There's a questioning, what's going on? Uh, and we get different kinds of answer to that question. We can get a poetic uh, answer, and we can get a, um, we can get a um, philosophical answer. In what does that difference consist? Um, Plato, as we will see in the next uh, lecture, uh, speaks in the Republic of an ancient quarrel between the poet and the philosopher. Uh, and he is thinking chiefly of Homer, as we will see, and the role that Homer played in, in Greek uh, education, the education of the, of the young. And what Plato is principally uh, incensed about in uh, the Homeric epics is the depiction of the gods. Uh, because as uh, Plato points out, uh, the Homeric gods do things and are praised for those things when those very things, if, per, if performed by a human being, would be reprehensible and, uh, and uh, punishable. So there's this confusion, as Plato sees it in, Hom uh, in Homer, uh, of uh, moral values by attributing all kinds of reprehensible behavior uh, to the gods and uh, putting it forward as uh, something to be, uh, uh, to be admired. The answer, then, that uh, a Homer gives is a kind of story. 
Uh, he gives us, if you want to know what's happening on earth, he gives you a story of what's going on in heaven. Uh, and it's as if you don't ask any further there, why are these gods warring among one another? Why are they trampling uh, this side as opposed to, to that side? That's just sort of the end of uh, an explanation. What um, Aristotle will give us as the note of the poet is this metaphor. Huh? Uh, the mark of genius, of poetic genius, is the gift for metaphor. Uh, and metaphor for Aristotle is to speak of a thing in terms of something else, huh? but in such a way that light is cast on what we are referring to. So that when the poet says, my love is like a red, red rose, uh, we're thinking of a rose, but somehow this is a medium uh, for thinking of the, of the beloved. And as we know, uh, it works. How does it work? Uh, rather mysteriously. But what we would not assume uh, is that the poet is literally uh, enamored of a rose. Huh? Uh, he might, he might uh, be a uh, florist, and, and when he says, my love is like a red, red rose, it might be like a red, red rose, because it is a red, red rose. And then it would be a very different sort of thing than when uh, the swain, uh, the uh, enamored youth, speaks of his um, beloved uh, on, uh, in terms of flowers. Huh? Okay, so this is, this is a metaphor, to take the term, the language of flowers, and transfer it uh, over to uh, talk of this very special human being, and somehow that conveys uh, to us uh, the uh, sense of uh, something about that girl that we would not otherwise know. But she isn't literally a rose. Huh? So what Aristotle will tend to suggest over the long haul, and uh, much more complicatedly uh, than I'm putting it here, is that in doing philosophy, what we want is a literal explanation. We want explanations which are appropriate to the thing being spoken about and are not importing uh, metaphorically language uh, from elsewhere. So let that suffice as a kind of first indication uh, of uh, what it is that distinguishes uh, the philosopher from the non-philosopher. It's not an abstract distinction. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is an historical distinction. There were certain people like Hesiod and, um, and Homer who are referred to uh, as non-philosophers by uh, Plato and uh, Aristotle. Uh, there were other people around shortly thereafter. Plato is usually, uh, is, uh, uh, Homer is usually placed in about 900 BC. Around the sixth century uh, BC, uh, we have the first uh, philosophers, uh, and according to uh, Plato uh, and Aristotle. And when we turn to them, as we will shortly, we're going to find it a little difficult at first uh, to see that they're doing something remarkably different uh, from what Homer, let's say, or uh, Hesiod, uh, uh, what these two uh, were doing, who are classified as, uh, as non-philosophers. But uh, what I'm going to do is to suggest that we think of the next uh, uh, element of this, of this lecture as giving us pre-Parmenidian philosophy. That is, we're going to talk about uh, those philosophers who live prior to uh, this uh, almost mythical figure uh, of Parmenides, who, uh, fi who uh, enters so dramatically uh, into uh, Plato and, uh, and into uh, Aristotle. He's clearly someone who marks a great uh, turning point uh, in the uh, development of philosophy uh, that, again, began in the 6th century BC. But when we get to Parmenides, something happens uh, which uh, casts the preceding uh, efforts into an entirely uh, new light. Um, the first uh, philosophers that we will have in mind, uh, the first who are um, who are put before us by Plato and Aristotle will be uh, the so-called Ionian philosophers. Uh, and they are Thales and Anaximenes and Anaximander and Heraclitus. Uh, take Thales. Thales is given to us as the first philosopher. We have nothing of his uh, by way of uh, writing. He, many things were said about him uh, in ancient accounts of uh, the seven wise men. He was one of them. Uh, he was uh, said to have written a book on celestial navigation. Uh, he was said uh, to have uh, produced uh, an algorithm whereby you could predict uh, the, the next uh, eclipse. But his doctrine is summed up uh, in three sentences. 
These are hearsay. All things are water or come from water. All things are alive and all things are divine. These are the doctrines attributed to the man who by common consent uh, is regarded as the first philosopher. So that as you can see, uh, our effort to distinguish between the philosopher and the non-philosopher has brought us to a point of some difficulty. Uh, how can we make any sense of what Thales is saying that would make our analysis differ, let's say, from interpreting uh, Homer? Our accounts of uh, why Thales said the things that he did, uh, namely that all things come from water, that all things are alive, and that all things are divine, uh, uh, tend to suggest that uh, he was uh, struck by the fact that moisture seems to be involved in any transmission uh, of uh, life from one generation uh, to the next, that uh, water is uh, an absolute necessity for survival and so forth. Uh, but nonetheless, this leaves uh, rather obscure why he would have uh, chosen uh, that particular mark of the, of the living uh, as opposed to uh, any number of others as the basic source. What, uh, what we're um, invited to consider here is that at this is the beginning of an effort to tell us what nature is. The Greek term is phusis, from which we get physics, of course. What is nature? And what nature means for the Greeks, as the Latin derivative does for us, is that which is born. Huh? So the uh, earliest philosophers are using this kind of approach to the coming into being of things, uh, namely the analysis of them as living things which are being born. Hence, perhaps, the second uh, doctrine that is attributed uh, to Thales that all things are alive. Fuain is the Greek uh, verb uh, infinitive from which phusis uh, comes, and it means to grow, to grow. So that uh, nature, the natural, uh, at the outset of philosophy uh, is such that we don't seem to have a distinction between the living and the non-living. Now this is as doubtless it should be because um, as we will be seeing when we uh, look at Aristotle uh, on these matters, well, let's mention it now. What Aristotle's account of the progress of human knowledge is, uh, goes this way. Uh, we first of all become aware of certain massively general truths uh, about things, and then we progress to more and more definitive or specific knowledge of that mass of things. So it is, uh, it is uh, not unexpected, perhaps, that uh, at the outset here, the generalization over the whole realm of things uh, was taken from those things that are alive and uh, the characteristics of these things being born uh, are attributed to any coming into being, uh, any natural becoming, as we might uh, sort of uh, prosaically put it. Uh, the earliest philosophers are speaking of this more dramatically as things being born. Now, we might think that this is, uh, this is a metaphor, and so, so it would be if there a clear distinction had been made between the living and the non-living. But uh, I am invoking Aristotle here uh, and, um, uh, and um, uh, a man named Barfield to suggest to you that that distinction is yet to be made. And until it is made, they're just, it's not as if the living is being contrasted with the non-living. Everything is being spoken of as if it were alive. And later on, a, uh, a cut will be made such that one will say, well, not everything is alive, at least not in that way. There are some things which are inorganic or non-living, and we'll separate them off uh, over, uh, over here. It's probably not wise uh, 
in, in uh, as rapid a presentation as that which we are engaged upon to dwell at great length on the particular doctrines attributed to the pre-Socratics. They're obscure, uh, uh, certainly, and uh, they are open to any number of interpretations. I mentioned Heraclitus as one of the earliest philosophers. The way he would figure into a kind of natural account of natural philosophy would be that he puts fire uh, at the source of, uh, of all things, as Anaximenes uh, suggested that air uh, is the source of all things and rarefaction and, and uh, uh, density and so forth. These would represent the changes that we, that we are observing. Of Heraclitus, we have something like 150 fragments. Huh? They're, they're little snippets. They look like epigrams. Uh, and uh, why they're arranged in the order that they are is itself a, a good question. They're, they're, draw, they're derived from all sorts of different uh, uh, authors, later authors, who say things about Heraclitus. The literature on Heraclitus is enormous. Huh? Some people are set afire when they read these 150 fragments, and they want to tell us what they really mean. The fact of the matter is we, we can't know. We can't really know. Uh, whether they're fragments of a single work, but we don't know what their order was, what role they played in, in, in the larger work. Uh, but this does not deter uh, scholars from an effort, and I don't mean to disparage those efforts, uh, to figure out what it is that he might have said or meant by what he, what he said. Uh, but um, my disposition is to, is to suggest there might be better ways uh, of spending uh, one's time uh, than that, because there, it's almost as if any number can play. It's hard to know what the rules are for a success or failure. We, um, we uh, turn now to uh, the figure that I gave as the kind of turning point uh, in early Greek philosophy. We have, let's say, these plotting efforts which are distinguished more or less perfectly from metaphorical efforts to give an account of what's going on in terms of natural changes about us. And these all presuppose what? That there are many things about us, that the world is a world of diversity and multiplicity, and that within that realm, things come into being and they pass out of being. Now, when Parmenides comes on the scene and his, uh, his uh, uh, birth date is, uh, is uh, often given as 515 BC, so he would fall roughly between Thales and, let's say, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, the fourth century, this golden period of, uh, of Greek philosophy. And what Parmenides uh, does uh, is to call a halt to what had begun uh, in the in Ionian philosophy in what is often seen as the beginnings of, uh, of natural uh, science. And what Parmenides, uh, uh, we, we do have a lot of Parmenides, relatively speaking, relative to those who came before him. Uh, and what Parmenides did was write a poem. Now, you see, here we have uh, a massive difficulty for the suggestion that philosophers are to be distinguished from poets in order to figure out what they're doing. Here comes Parmenides, now one of the greatest philosophers, according to both Plato and Aristotle, and he expresses himself in a poem. And it is a poem that comes to us uh, not whole, but uh, suggestive of the whole. There is, first of all, a proemium. Uh, and Parmenides portrays himself as having been swept in a chariot up into the heavens and to have received a great revelation, uh, which he is now commissioned to bring down to earth and tell us about. So he is establishing his authoritative credentials in a very religious way. He comes, uh, he comes before us as a kind of prophet, uh, as a spokesman uh, for the divine. Uh, what is his message? Well, he's got two messages, really. He says there is, there, uh, the first part of, uh, one part of uh, Parmenides' poem is called The Way of Being, The Way of Reality. And the other is called The Way of Seeming the way of seeming. And here we have, for the first time, uh, and it's an absolutely crucial uh, development uh, in uh, philosophical thought, we have a distinction and an opposition created between what we see with our senses and what really is the case, between appearance, sensation, 
and reality understanding. And there is there's no bridge between them. We repudiate uh, the realm of the senses uh, and turn to the realm of reality. That's the suggestion of the poem. What is it that appears to us to be the case? What I mentioned a moment ago, that the world is made up of a number of things, that there is a plurality of things and beings in the world, and that they are changing. They come into being, they alter all kinds of ways while they're in uh, existence, and then they pass out of existence. What Parmenides is saying is this, stop. That cannot be. It looks that way, and in the uh, way of appearance, he will give us an account that looks not unlike those that we're familiar with from uh, his predecessor, that is, on the assumption that there are many things that are changing and coming to be and all that sort of thing. But the real message of Parmenides is none of that is so. It can't be so. So what we, what we find in Parmenides is, is this. The only truth that can be uttered and understood is being is, or being is one. There is no multiplicity whatsoever, and there is no change. If there were either one of these two, Parmenides is suggesting, we are going to have to commit the fundamental logical fallacy of saying that that which is, is not, and that which is not, is. How in the world uh, does he arrive at this? So th th at any rate, these logical rules are what prevent us from taking seriously the testimony of our senses and engaging seriously in the effort to understand what's going on in the physical world around us. What Parmenides is saying, well, you can talk about it if you want, but don't think there's anything really there. The only thing that's real, the only truth uh, that expresses uh, something other than uh, uh, the, only, the only phrase that expresses a, a truth and not a falsehood is being is. That's it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, that simple. Why did, why did he get to the point of, uh, of thinking uh, that the world of appearance violates these, uh, these logical laws as he tends to, uh, to express them? I mean, he doesn't call them that, but uh, what, what we cannot violate is this. We cannot say that being is not, and we cannot say that what is not is being. Now, why does multiplicity and change uh, run us uh, afoul of those fairly reasonable uh, demands. If you have two things, A and B, A is A and B is B, but A is not B and B is not A. So that you're saying in order for A to be A, it has to not be something else, reasonable enough. But for Parmenides, this violates the uh, notion uh, that uh, there that we cannot say that what is, uh, is not. We might put it another way. If we say there are two beings, in virtue of what would they differ? Well, if we say they differ in, there are two possibilities, being and non-being. If we say that they differ in being, uh, that's no difference at all. So A and B must be the one being that is. Uh, and if we say they, they differ in nothing, that means there's no difference between them, so we end up, again, with uh, only one being. That's a kind of corollary of what, uh, of what Parmenides is after. But basically what he's saying is that any talk of change or multiplicity is going to violate the home truth that being is not not being, and not being is not being. Uh, Parmenides is, uh, is a very obscure figure if we take him uh, on, uh, on the basis of, if we understand him on the basis of the fragments of the poem that have come down uh, to it. But he has, he's one of the most fascinating figures in the history of philosophy in the sense that later uh, thinkers refer back to him as uh, what Plato and Aristotle indicated that he was a great turning point uh, in philosophy. But one of, the, one of the epistemological, if, we can, uh, if you'll forgive me, uh, ways of putting uh, Parmenides' uh, contribution, if that's what it is, 
uh, is by not simply contrasting what our senses tell us and what we understand uh, as two different uh, modes of grasping reality, but as opposing them to one another uh, and suggesting that we have to choose between what our senses tell us, the testimony of our senses on the one hand, and what makes sense in an abstract or in a logical way on uh, in another. So this distinction between what appears and, and what's really real will be decisive uh, for Plato, and this is one of the reasons uh, why Parmenides looms so large uh, in the writings of Plato. One of the dialogues, uh, as we will be seeing, is called the Parmenides, uh, and in it, at a crucial point in the development of Plato's doctrine, uh, he presents us with the young Socrates. He's been old in, in the dialogues uh, up to this point, who is in conversation with Father Parmenides, who comes to uh, Athens, and he is this embodiment of wisdom. Uh, and the young Socrates uh, uh, enters into conversation with Parmenides about uh, the central doctrine that we'll be looking at, the central doctrine of Plato's philosophy, which is predicated on uh, this Parmenidian distinction between appearance and reality. So Parmenides is a massively important figure uh, for uh, Plato. Uh, he looms very large in Aristotle as well. When Aristotle in his physics is laying out for us uh, what he takes to be the beginnings of our knowledge of the natural world, and he, in the first book of the eight books of the physics, is recounting for us what his predecessors had to say. Uh, and this is always a serious enterprise for, for Aristotle. He's interested in what contributions they made to the discipline that he is currently uh, engaged in, and he never ridicules uh, almost never, ridicules the views of his predecessors. They might look as various as uh, can be, they might look totally incompatible with one another, but Aristotle will, on reflection, suggest that there is a common assumption beneath this diversity. So he's always looking for help. He's not just looking for a foil for his own thought, uh, as if he were saying, listen to this gibberish that uh, people were uttering prior to me, and now here is uh, the truth of the matter. Not at all. But in the first book of the physics, when he gives the account of what he calls the first philosophers of nature, the first natural philosophers, who are trying to tell us what nature is, what uh, physical change is, what physical objects are, the product of these, of these changes, uh, he will come to Parmenides and will portray him there as putting the brakes on this whole effort by saying, well, sure, you can talk that way, but there's nothing really to talk about. There's nothing really there. There can't be. There can't be multiplicity, and there can't be change. And however much it appears to us that uh, these things are true, multiplicity and change, however inevitable, perhaps, uh, it is that we're going to talk as if they were true, what we have to do is constantly remind ourselves that they <laughs> these things can't be true, and the only thing that is true is that being is, that being uh, is, um, uh, is one. Now, if, if Parmenides were right, of course, it would indeed stop uh, any efforts to explain the happenings around us as a serious inquiry. We would simply be uh, explaining what appears but is not the case, appears to be the case but is not the case. Not a very exciting uh, prospect uh, for someone engaged on, on a life's work. So Aristotle has to look at what it is that Parmenides uh, said. He, he's able to show us that um, after Parmenides, any number of people tried to uh, continue what had been going on before uh, by skirting uh, the strictures of Parmenides uh, against multiplicity and chain. Usually what they would do is waive uh, the stricture against multiplicity and then argue that nothing really new was coming into being as a result of what we call change. So they would start off with a infinite set uh, of uh, elements, let's say, and say that change is merely the combination uh, and recombination of these elements, but there's nothing really real, like the elements, that comes into being as the result of a change. And when 
the grouping uh, is dispersed, nothing really real ceases uh, to be. Uh, Aristotle will uh, find that uh, bizarre because very often the things that are put forward as the really real things, the elements out of which uh, macrocosmic and surface things are composed, are themselves uh, inferred entities. Uh, it's rather difficult to think of them as the things that we would first of all know. So, what we, And what we do know right off the bat is that things like uh, horses and trees and your mother-in-law and so forth, they're real objects, they're units, they're not just happenstance groupings of uh, whatever. So if those things aren't one, this is Aristotle's view, then what else is one? And as a matter of fact, uh, he will suggest that when we talk about elements as one, we're really talking uh, about them on the model of macrocosmic things. So it's an odd sort of uh, explanation. But his main uh, concern with Parmenides uh, is to address the claim that becoming violates the uh, stricture against saying that being is non-being or non-being is being. Uh, and uh, we will return to this uh, later uh, because it's more fittingly uh, described in terms of uh, our account of Aristotle's uh, doctrine. But I wanted to mention it here by way of anticipation, as I do uh, mention by way of anticipation Plato's dialogue, the Parmenides, uh, as indicating the continuing and profound influence uh, that uh, Parmenides uh, had in ancient philosophy, and not only in ancient philosophy. Uh, the contemporary philosopher Heidegger uh, has devoted a great deal of attention uh, to Parmenides, not least because uh, it is here that we have the difference between seeming and being, between being and, uh, and appearance. After Parmenides, usually when, when we talk about the earliest uh, part of the history of ancient philosophy, we speak of pre-Socratic philosophy. So I'm being a little, um, a little um, uh, idiosyncratic in speaking of pre-Parmenidian philosophy, but take this to be a kind of division uh, between the beginnings of philosophy with Thales and Eximenes and Eximander on the one hand and the 4th century B.C. The 4th century BC, I've referred to it already, as the golden age of ancient philosophy. And what we have uh, in that uh, period in Athens is the remarkable sequence of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Socrates and, and Plato, native Athenians, uh, uh, Aristotle, and uh, immigre from uh, Macedonia. Uh, who uh, was associated with Alexander uh, the Great. His father was a physician at the court of Alexander the Great. And um, um, Aristotle is some, sometimes said to, be, um, to have been the tutor of the young uh, Alexander, uh, the conqueror of the then known uh, world. Uh, Aristotle had lots of faults. That might have been one of them. But at any rate, he came to uh, Athens uh, and uh, entered the academy, the school, uh, of Plato. But Plato, when we turn to Plato, we're always being referred to Socrates. Socrates is, is the um, almost constant presence uh, in the writings of Plato that have come down to us, Some, something like uh, uh, a couple of dozen uh, dialogues. Uh, and what I want to do uh, in, uh, as I terminate uh, this uh, first lecture uh, in the history of uh, ancient uh, philosophy is to put before you, uh, as best I can, uh, this, this figure of Socrates, uh, who comes before us as almost a philosophical saint. Uh, what, what we find in, uh, among the writings of Plato are, first of all, the uh, relevant to Socrates himself, the apology of Socrates. Uh, and this is Socrates' uh, response to the court that had convicted him and uh, had sentenced him to death uh, on the basis of his stirring up trouble uh, in Athens by the kind of questioning and uh, discussions uh, that he generated just, uh, just naturally. Uh, Socrates was a war veteran. He came back to uh, Athens and uh, he decided that he did not want, like others, to, um, to devote himself to the study of the natural world. He was much more interested in the city and in human beings and the interaction among human beings. 
Uh, and uh, the story of Socrates is that uh, he was told once that he was the wisest man in Athens, which came to him as a, as a tremendous surprise. Uh, and uh, eventually he tried to find out what this could possibly mean. Uh, and when he consulted the Sibyl uh, on this, uh, he was told that the reason uh, he was the wisest man in Athens was that while others knew nothing, they didn't seem to know that they knew nothing, whereas Socrates knows nothing and he knows that he knows nothing. So this sort of ironic Socratic ignorance uh, characterizes the figure of Socrates. But this is, let me just pull almost arbitrarily uh, from the apology uh, of, uh, of uh, Socrates given us by Plato uh, a, a few lines. He's addressing the jury, he's addressing the court. You are mistaken, my friend, if you think that a man who is worth anything ought to spend his mind weighing up the prospects of life and death. He has only one thing to consider in performing any action, that is, whether he is acting rightly or wrongly, like a good man or a bad one. On your view, the heroes who died at Troy would be poor creatures, especially the son of Thetis. And he refers to those who, who fought and died for the sake of honor. And he refers uh, uh, in, the, in the next paragraph to his own war experience and suggests that what if I, when I was asked to take a stand uh, here, had decided uh, not to, uh, would I be someone that you would want to put forward uh, as, uh, as your own, uh, as any kind of a model? Uh, the, the apology ends with, uh, with a uh, famous line which we ought to uh, have before us uh, at this moment. It ends with Socrates saying to the court, now it is time that we were going. I to die, he's going to be executed, and you to live. But which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but God. When in the Crito, or in the Phaedo rather, the friends of Socrates uh, get together to hear an account of his last days, he's awaiting execution uh, in, uh, in jail, and uh, the execution will be, uh, the time of it will be set when a certain ceremonial ship arrives in harbor, uh, and then uh, Socrates will be, uh, will be uh, uh, forced to take, or we must take the hemlock, that, uh, that is, the, uh, is the means whereby his life will uh, be ended. Not by his own will, but by the will of the uh, uh, Athenian people. Uh, during the discussion in his death cell with his friends, who are of course abject and uh, uh, finding this a very difficult uh, moment, uh, they, they of course suggest to him, why don't you cheat, cheat the executioner? Why don't you escape? Why don't you get out of here? Uh, and presumably that would not have been impossible. Uh, and, uh, or, another way, why don't you che cheat the executioner by taking your life prior uh, to the arrival of, of that ship? You then will be the master uh, of this event and not merely the victim of the, of the court. And Socrates gives a memorable response to that. Uh, he cannot take his own life because he does not belong to himself. He is not his own possession. Uh, he belongs to God. And only God can, uh, can exercise that kind of control, rightly, over, over life and death. So this memorable pagan uh, testimony uh, against suicide is certainly that in our own time runs contrary to a very uh, dominant notion that somehow we belong to ourselves and anything we decide to do uh, is, uh, is okay. And particularly, it was just a matter of checking out who other than ourselves could possibly uh, have any objection uh, to, uh, to that or who other than ourselves could, uh, uh, could uh, have uh, control over our lives. Huh? So the, the notion that, that suicide involves someone other than ourselves and other human beings is present here in a vivid way uh, in the apology or in the uh, death scene of, um, of, uh, of uh, Socrates. And when he's gone, when this account has been given, uh, the narrator says, and thus died one of the noblest and best men that we have ever known. So Socrates is put forward as a kind of secular saint, a philosophical uh, saint. The good life uh, is uh, what 
uh, what we're about. And uh, as Plater will attribute to him in another dialogue, uh, the whole point of philosophizing is learning how to die. Huh? A, a startling uh, kind of uh, thing, unless we think back to the origins of Plato's philosophizing in this influence of the Socratic example. Socrates functions, as, I, as I've mentioned, in almost all of the dialogues of Plato, and very often he's simply a figure who is entering into conversations that he never entered into uh, historically. But the apology uh, and the Phaedo, uh, the Crito, these early accounts uh, seem to be as historical as, as we can expect. And the figure of Socrates looms massively large, and he will define uh, the golden age of Greek philosophy, the fourth century. His influence on, on Plato is total. In fact, we would know very little of Socrates if it, uh, if it weren't for Plato. Uh, the only way we do know about Socrates is because several people wrote about him. Uh, and uh, Xenophon was, uh, uh, was another. He shows up in, in a comic uh, uh, Greek uh, drama, uh, and it's, it's a matter of some uh, interest for scholars to try to put together these three different uh, Socrates as they seem. But historically, Socrates, as he's given to us by Plato, uh, is the Socrates who function uh, in the history of philosophy and who function in the fourth century. Uh, you see, uh, first of all, on Plato, and then on Plato's pupil, uh, Aristotle, in different ways, but nonetheless, they would be unintelligible uh, without uh, the uh, example of, uh, of Socrates.